This is module five, which is advertising as part of a marketing strategy course. And uh, it, when we talk about the different methods of promoting your product, of integrated marketing communication. Your kind of traditional advertising has been in a, a slump for quite a long period of time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's Super Bowl week. I'm going to be on the radio, uh, local radio, the the uh, Larry Brogan and Fred McCarra's uh, Business Matter show tomorrow, talking about you know what to look for in terms of the Super Bowl ads, and then I'll be on the radio uh, following week after the Super Bowl, talking about well, you know what were the results or who who won the big contest and and that kind of thing. Uh, so you can still see that when it comes say to reaching young males, males in the the, the demo you know, 18 to 35. When it comes to reaching young males, NFL football is still the king. Now, fewer and fewer kids are playing American-style football. Uh, more and more kids are, are, are playing, uh, the, you know, the football that's played in the rest of the world, the football that's played with the round ball. And that type of football is becoming bigger and bigger in the United States. I mean, we have uh, really big turnouts for some of the football games here. We have at ETSU, those of y'all that are that are watching this on YouTube, ETSU has a really excellent football team. And we did, we've done really well the last years. We did so well that one of the bigger schools just stole our coach. And we're really upset about it. Uh, and uh, I'm not optimistic that they're going to – that the, the athletic department is going to hire another great coach. But I hope that they prove me wrong. And then I'll have to go back and say, hey, I wasn't – you know, I wasn't sure you guys were up to it, but you did it. So hopefully we'll have a great new football coach here at, uh, at ETSU for our uh, really good football program. And I wish the guys – we had a couple guys that graduated and didn't get uh, scholarships – I mean, uh, didn't get drafted. Uh, in the, ML, the four rounds of the MLS draft, hopefully they'll find a, a USL or an MPSL slot and work their way up into the big times. I think we definitely have two players that are capable of playing, uh, three or four players that are capable of playing professional soccer, and at least two or three, uh, I'd say three, and I, I said two, but I really mean three, sorry, uh, uh, Blake Woodruff, I forgot you. Uh, but we have three players that are capable of playing professional soccer, and I hope that they're successful and, and, uh, in, in all of that. Now, I'm going to start this module on, on advertising by talking about positioning. And positioning is an idea that was developed by uh, Rise and Trout, and my professor said Rise, and other people have said Rees and Trout, and I'm not sure what the correct pronunciation is. My old advertising professor who knew them, uh, uh, Rees and Trout. And uh, Rees and Trout, actually from Atlanta, they're, they're, you know, they, they run their business out of Atlanta. And they, to say that they're in the, they were originally kind of in the advertising business, but now really they're in the advertising strategy business. And this is marketing strategy that's right up our alley. Now, positioning, when we say, we use the term positioning in marketing two different ways. And we mean something that, that it's a little bit similar, but it really is different. And people who are brand managers or product people, in the product aspect of, of marketing, we use the word positioning, and we're thinking about a perceptual map. You know, we're thinking about, say, there's the, there's the high-quality, high-price position. There's the low-quality, low-price position. And then there's a kind of middle-quality, middle-price position. And our product, you know, we're going to make one brand for here. We're going to make Michelob for the high-quality, high-price. We're going to make Budweiser for the middle, and we're going to make Natty's. Uh, bushes, and natural bu natural light bushes, natties. Why don't I have bush bush beer for the, the the low end? And that's product positioning. That's something different. When advertising people, rise and trout. And the, uh, they, they've got a couple articles that you can read. They, positioning Era Cometh was an article that I read. Uh, positioning the Battle for Your Mind is a book. It's been several uh, editions of that book have come out. And uh, what they're doing is that they, they when, you know, even though we talked about marketing being involved in the conception and conceptualization and development of products, by the time it gets to an advertiser, the advertiser takes the brand or product as a fact. It's there, it exists, and then they want to turn it into a, a, a mental concept.
Uh, the positioning theory developed by Rising Trout, one of the first things they said was uh, that, you know, there's a limit to the human mind in its ability to retain and put things into long-term memory. And, you know, normally when we do multi-attribute models, and we, we did one for marketing segmentation, uh, the class before you watch this, or the you, if you want, if you went to class and had module two before you're watching this, we did this. If you're watching this first, and then you're going to go to class on Tuesday night for module two, we'll we'll talk about the multi-attribute models, uh, where you know people look at a, a complex decision and they've got this aspect of it and this aspect of it, and they weight it, and then they kind of sum all of that together and they develop an overall attitude towards a particular brand or an attitude towards uh, uh, buying that particular brand, a purchase intention type of attitude towards buying that particular brand. In, in, in those types of things, even in those, we're buying like a complex decision process, like, a, like buying a car, renting a house, buying a house. There may be a hundred different factors that might possibly come into consideration, but the human mind's not capable of doing that, and they recognize, uh, we used to say when I was uh, an MBA student, it was seven plus or minus two. That only seven plus or minus two things can actually get into what we think of as a consideration set. You know, the, 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 the number of things that, that there's an evoke set, which is the number of possible things. And if we, we spent, you know, you, you tied somebody up, or, uh, strapped them down in a room in a chair and gave them a pen and a piece of paper, write down how many different things that people could possibly come up with uh, when it, in terms of uh, different criteria for buying a car. And then, you know, that would be the evoke set. But now when people actually do it, the consideration set used to be, the, you know, when you say seven plus or minus two, now for the, and people say five plus or minus two. And then they even go unless like four plus or minus two, I guess as the human mind becomes, the modern human mind is not, either not as smart as the older, the older generation was, or has too many other things going on and is too busy and always going to consider you know, four plus or minus two, but I'll stick, I'll stay with five plus or minus two things in the consideration set. And I think we, you know, the test question, we'll have a couple examples, uh, possible examples of five different criteria for buying a house, renting a house, uh, buying a car, some complex decision. Now for a simple decision, when people go into the store, people go into the store to buy, uh, and I remembered all of a sudden his head and shoulders dandruff shampoo that I forgot in module four. Uh, I can't believe that I couldn't remember head and shoulders. They were the first ones to go anti-dandruff and to explain to people how what a horrible thing dandruff was and that nice guy Ted would have a lot of girls want to date him if it wasn't for that dandruff. Uh, that's the head and shoulders from uh, from before, that's a simple decision. When we go into the store to buy shampoo, uh, we don't go through a lot of complex processing. And uh, there's a, a famous article by Cassiopo and Petty, if I pronounce the name right, uh, where they looked at central and peripheral processing. And if you have a complex decision, uh, which they call a high involvement decision, and high involvement is a kind of level of interest or arousal associated with buying a particular product, like buying a new car. Uh, doesn't have to be. Now, for some people, it can be a low involvement decision. They call a car, you know, it's got a lot of money, call a car dealer, what's the, you know, here, I'm just email you these specs, tell me what you can do. And they just say, okay, nah, you gotta, you gotta give, get, get me a little bit better deal, and that's it. In, in 10 minutes, two emails, and they bought the car. And they'll be down to pick it up, have all the paperwork ready out, you know, I'm gonna write you a check, I'm not gonna finance it, have all the paperwork ready, I need to get out of there in like 15 minutes and pick up the car and go. But for most people, it's a high involvement decision. There's a lot of interest and excitement, arousal uh, associated with uh, the, the purchase of that particular type of product. For high involvement purchase decisions, we do some thinking. We do some of that multi-attribute model where we look at the gas mileage, the price, uh, the stylishness of the car, the cup holders, the other factors that really matter, matter to us, and then we make a decision and get the, what we feel is best for us. For low involvement decisions, though, which is most of the common things that you see advertised in the Super Bowl, are going to be for fairly low involved Fritos and Cokes, uh, soft drinks, chi uh, chips, uh, beer, 
those are very low involvement decisions. We don't spend, a, we're not going to spend a lot of time processing, burning mental calories, making those decisions. And most of our search is kind of internal. We have a lot of experience in the class, and yeah, we like these chips. No, we don't. We like spicy chips, so we're going to get something a little bit spicy. We don't like stuff that's too spicy, or our stomach doesn't like stuff that's too spicy. We're going to stay with the something that's not too spicy and doesn't have a lot of uh, spices in it. Whatever the decision is, it's, a, it's going to be very simple, and it's going to be made very quickly. In a situation like that, what Rise and Trout says is the human mind is limited. You, you know, one thing maybe two, but one key thing that is going to stand out for that product. What is the one key thing that's going to stand out for the product? For Budweiser at Beechwood Aged, years and years and years of, you know, it's Beechwood Aged. Uh, the, the white beer, it tastes great, two things. It tastes great at the same time as less filling. Now you can call that one thing, call it two things. But So you wanted to identify the key assets of the product. What is it that makes them? And then also, when they say the key assets, it can't be a key asset if everybody else does it too. It's not an asset. And this is an important thing for businesses to understand and when you all become executives to remember this. It's not a key marketing asset if everybody else is doing the same thing. If everybody else is able to do the, exactly the same thing, it's, it's got to be something that differentiates us, a differentiator in the rise in trout language. Uh, obtain a place in the person's mind. A centrally located, well-connected, thus readily accessible switch. And this has to do with memory. And when I, when I was young, the people thought the way memory worked was that there was this perfect recording device. And all of life's memories went into this recording, were recorded. Everything from like when we were, maybe not when we were babies, but from even, you know, three, four years old, everything that happened went into this place in memory. Now the recording, the playback mechanism was a little bit faulty. And our we could all, we could play back certain things, but other things we couldn't play back. And certain say traumatic events might be repressed, and the you know psychoanalysts would try to get people to talk about their most painful, frightening, horrible experiences. And then by by unrepressing those, that was supposed to be the way to cure that type of whatever the problems that were associated with that. Uh, and that's the way we thought things happened. You know, that, you know we just, if we could just get the playback mechanism to work, everything would work. And that in theory, somebody might have a memory that they had all, if you had access to all, the, everything that was in your memory, you could play back everything in your life because it was all there. We now know that the recording mechanism is also faulty. It's not just the playback mechanism is faulty. The recording mechanism, some things go into short-term memory, some things go into kind of a medium-term, and other things go into long-term memory. So if we want to, what we want is, and then once it goes into memory, there are connections. And you think of it as little kind of synapses or neurons that are firing. And there are certain places that are well-connected. You know, obviously for me, the in my, when I was lecturing on module four a few minutes ago, uh, being a you know the dandruff shampoo head and shoulders, just didn't get into the right didn't have enough synapses, or maybe the playback mechanism in my brain is starting to falter. Uh, but the synapses, the connections, and all the different ways that can, we, we want a centrally located, well connected, and, and I think in terms of the practical aspect of this, we mean readily accessible immediately accessible. So when somebody goes in the store, they see the different shampoos, oh, head and shoulders is the one for dandruff. And, you know, I've got dark hair and I wear a lot of dark clothes, so I better be careful about that dandruff. And so that central location. Now the process of positioning is that you kind of, you start off, you identify the, the you know, your brand's competitors. You know, who is it that's in the same group as you? Uh, Dr. Stead would call it in the same strategic group. But, of course, we're looking at this at the brand, not at, it, 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 although in the PowerPoint, I think I said the businesses. I'm about the, at the brand level. What are the main, you know, who is it that's going after the our market share for this particular brand? 
Uh, and then you un- try to understand how the biz, how consumers, people who use the product, uh, you know, sorry. Then you understand, okay, what is it that the key differentiators are for these other products, for these other companies, and what is it that they're doing? Uh, what you know? What is it that those companies are doing to position themselves? What is what is their in in their mind the competitors, the people that are competing with our brand for their market share? What is it that they are trying to do with the mind of the consumer? What is it the consumers feel about our competitors' products, or what is the position that the competitors try to create for their products? Uh, and it may be that one brand claims it's the fastest, other brand claims the cheapest. We're number one. We have the largest. We're the most popular, uh, fastest, faster, cheaper, larger, prettier, whatever it is. Okay. Now then, you try to figure out what it is that our clients brand. What is it today? What is its position? Where where is it positioned in the mind of consumers today? Now, of course, if it's a new brand or a startup business, or it's in some really new area where people, you know, uh, companies or businesses or customers are not aware of the of what that brand does, then this existing position may not there may not be there. Uh, now. Okay, so then you want to try to figure out, okay, if, if these companies are, if this company is fastest, okay, you know, we're not as fastest. What is it that we do better than anybody else? You know, what is it that we can, where can we be that's not what everybody else is? Where, you know, what can we do? What can, where, what position in the mind of the consumer can we claim? And then you have to come up with the creative idea. You have to come up with this distinctive, differentiating, value-based. In the modern era, is a lot, you know, emphasis on the value-based positioning concept. Something that, and you know, because we talked about the, the value model and we went over uh, an actual physical model uh, and a quantitative method for determining customer perceptions of, of value. We need to find something that's going to impact value that through improving need fulfillment, minimizing risk, uh, minimizing time and effort, you know, making it easier to do, uh, minimizing time and effort, uh, something that's unique and that will, that will ring, uh, you know, since unique, but it's also important in terms of the impact that that will have on the value concept. So, uh, and then it's a matter of developing the, the, you know, the advertising, the media, the PR, the website, whatever it is, the key messages, usually a thematic statement, and a lot of the great positioning uh, ideas that are in Rise and Trout's book and we talk about today, those great ideas are oftentimes a theme. And it's a very short, you would think of it as a slogan. I think if we were a consumer, we'd think of it as a slogan. Uh, but for you know, business, think of it as a theme, a theme for what that brand is all about. And it's, uh, that, that theme is kind of, you think of it as a fast read on what that brand is all about. And you, you know, the light beer tastes great, less filling. Uh, how many years have they been using that? You know, many, many, many years, many different execution styles, different uh, execution methods, but that's what they did. Uh, uh, was get that uh, Hertz, who was not number one, they were number two, so they tried harder. And the we're number two, we try harder. And the, was the you know that great thematic slogan that uh, the the problem was they they were so successful that they they came close to being number one, and uh, so they you know wouldn't have been able to use that anymore. But uh, some way in which our, our brand does something bigger, better, faster, stronger. Now, the execution methods for positioning. Uh, you can, you know, come up with a product attribute. Uh, you know, head and shoulders is, is prevents dandruff. Uh, a particular toothpaste may taste good for kids. Uh, it may be the just, you know, the, or it, it has some kind of, uh, it has fluorine, fluoride in it that's more effective but still tastes good. Uh, 
Uh, could be uh, cup holders in a car. You'll see different aspects of vehicles. Uh, the four, you know, the first. The green, but be an SUV. The green SUVs, the hybrid SUVs, I think are going to be advertised some on the Super Bowl uh, this weekend. That you know, it's 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 an SUV and it's big and it's tough and it rumbles, but it also gets great gas mileage. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, you know something gets better, I think in the playoff games they had uh, the. Uh, company that the Ford Fusion was advertised and they've got a guy that talks about once you get in a car how it feels you know it's a Fusion's a high performance car but it still gets good gas mileage but it's a high performance car it feels right so different product attributes value uh, the, the positioning execution method may be based on value in other words you have typically uh, you have the value defined as what people get for what they give up well then that's a you know the quality versus compared to the price that quality divided by price ratio or quality divided by right uh, price quotient is very favorable to the customer. So you can get, and I think you have cars like a Cadillac for many years, you know, they've had different campaigns, but one of the things they try to do is they, they say, you know, we've got a luxury car and it's it's got everything that the, the top end, the, 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 sometimes they'll even physically have a comparison ad where they'll compare themselves to a Lexus. And the idea is that it's just as good as a Lexus, but it costs $30,000 less. Hyundai. The kind of the same thing with their new they I think last year they had their 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 new luxury model, whatever it is, and they were advertising it and they were using that value, price uh, quality divided by price quotient or uh, and they were using that as a ratio and they were using that as their their primary positioning execution methods. Uh, use or application especially if it's unique and the others can't do it. For example, Microsoft, their tablets have full office, whereas the, the, the company they're competing against, uh, you know, Apple's products don't have office. And it's a pain, to, and I'm not even sure you can get office even now for a uh, iPad. And, you know, if you, you can't get office, you can't really work. Uh, if there was anything in the antitrust when they had all the antitrust stuffs against Microsoft, I wish they'd have gone after Office rather than the web browser. Honestly, because Office is a it is locked down uh, business applications. You know the Excel and PowerPoint and uh, Microsoft Word and everything they have just totally dominated. And I, I is an old user of Word Perfect. To me, Microsoft Word today is still not as good as Word Perfect was, but. My, I, they talk to each other. You know, WordPerfect didn't really talk to Lotus and didn't really talk to databases and didn't really talk to, uh, uh, you know, the other spreadsheets that were available of that era. And so Microsoft has put everything into a seamless kind of package. So uh, also there was, uh, if you remember some of the ads, and I'm going back a year or two here, but the big battle between AT&T and Verizon uh, AT&T had smartphones where you could talk on the talk and surf the web at the same time. You know, and they, they have a guy that forgot to make a reservations for their anniversary, and he said, yeah, of course I made reservations. And the Verizon products at the time, their system would not allow you to talk and, uh, and, and use the web at the same time. So they used that unique product quality to uh, they use that unique product quality now there's a company now and I want to say it's Verizon that they they have maps and they're showing their 4G map and they're showing a, a another company's map and and their map is all colored in the other company's map is all white meaning you know there's not they don't have nearly the Ver, Verizon's big competitive advantage or, is that you can use it everywhere you know, you can, you can be many more places and use their product, they say, than the competing company's products. So a, a, a use or application, especially one that's unique or at least that the other competitors don't have. Uh, put yourself in a particular product class. Like, you, you know, you want to claim that you're, a, a, and uh, is a Cadillac and a Hyundai luxury car in the same class with Mercedes, Benz, and Lexus? Well, they want to put themselves in that class. By putting themselves in that class, they're, they're elevating their status, and they're making themselves be part of a different group, uh, a higher group, a group that uh, for which, uh, you know, 
people should be willing to pay more money because it's a high quality uh, group. Uh, using who uses the product. And this is where you have all your celebrity endorsers and people that, uh, that use the product. Uh, Michael Jordan drinking Gatorade, and they have actually have the, the, uh, the ads, some of the early versions of the ads. Literally, they had a song, Be Like Mike. And they would show uh, Michael Jordan, you know, jumping through the air. He'd jump at the, about the foul line and uh, glide through the air. Sometimes they'd slow it down. And I think with some of the uh, – Spike Lee may have even done some of these commercials where they, they slowed it down and he glides through the air and he, he comes down and he dunks the ball. And, and, you know, how many of us can dunk? I mean, I, I've had students that are 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six and can't dunk. Now, I also had a student that was, that, that was uh, about 5'2", and, and was about like me, uh, at least more than me, overweight. And uh, so he's 5'2", and he, he, he weighed, you know, probably a couple hundred pounds, and he said he could dunk it. So, you know, yeah, but not many, you know, that 5'2 student apparently can dunk a basketball, but uh, there's a lot of, very few people can dunk a ball. I mean, the average height, I think, is 5'8 is or 5'9", and... Uh, you really, you know, there's some spud webs and, and stuff like that that can dunk the ball at a lower height. But, you know, a lot of people, 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", can't dunk. And so uh, how many people can jump at the foul line and dunk it? Not very many. Well, how many of us can be Michael Jordan or be like Michael Jordan? We can't really be like Michael Jordan. But we can drink the same sports drink as Michael Jordan. Or we can uh, go to this, you know, and then and other drinks. Uh, one of the most famous, the one I would have showed you in class if we hadn't been snowed out. And it's my, to me, it's the, the it usually comes in second, third, fourth for the greatest commercials of all time. But to me, it's the best commercial of all time. And if you're at home, you can uh, just Google this. a Mean Joe Green uh, Coke ad. And uh, you look at, you know, who uses the product. And uh, people like, you know, Mean Joe Green, they're thirsty and they're, they want something refreshing to drink, and they drink a Coke. Uh, repositioning competitors. And the, you do this sometimes through comparative ads. And you'll see, you know, with the, the repositioning competitors, the ad where they're showing the cell phone maps, coverage maps for 4G, the 4G cell phone coverage map. And it may not be Verizon. It may be somebody else that's just better at 4G. But I think it's Verizon. I want to say that it shows the coverage maps. And they show the coverage map, and they show, you know, this other, these other people are, are lightweights. I mean, look at where you all these different places where you can't get coverage. And unless you're in a big city or on the interstate, you, you, and for these other guys, you're not going to be able to use your phone. You, and in the times, really, when you need to use your phone and you need to, like, search the web and find out where the gas station is and is when you're traveling a lot. You're not at home. So uh, for people who travel a lot and use it, that, you know, not being able to get service is a big deal. So repositioning the competitors so that they're something less than they should be. Uh, pointing out that Apple... And the implication of the Microsoft ads that talk about, you know, having full office, and they literally, uh, the, they have the Apple say, the Apple products say, the iPad say, well, let's just go back to reading. And the, the implication is, okay, if you want to read or you want to play games, you know, I guess the iPad's okay. But the, uh, the new Microsoft thing, it can also, they, I think it can do two things at once. Oh, you can't do two things at once. You can't have two windows open at once, or you can't leave this window open over here in your, uh, in, in your game and go over here and take care of some work and go back. Can't do that. Uh, you have to go out and close out this thing, and then you have to open up something new. And you can't, so you can't do two things, and you can't do So they're positioning the competitors as something less than as just a toy. Instead of being an iPad, which is a great device for work and you take the meetings and you can do stuff with it, uh, it doesn't have office, so it's just a toy. And you can't do two things at once, so it's not very convenient. Uh, so that repositioning competitors is the next one. Now, uh, I'm on the test question, on the test, you will have questions about the great campaigns of history. And the first great campaign of history, which is not on the PowerPoint but is on the test study guide, is the Marlboro repositioning campaign. To me, this is the greatest advertising campaign ever. 
that they were selling a product that would end up killing many people, uh, including several of the Marlboro men who played in the ads. I mean, that's uh, if we're looking at it purely not from an ethical standpoint, but from a purely from a efficacy standpoint. It was the most successful ad campaign ever. Uh, Marlboro, at one time, I don't want to because because this is part of your readings, and I want you to read about this. Uh, go, you know, find some readings about this. There's plenty of stuff you can find out there. I'm just going to hint at it, and I'm not going to give you all the answers here. But at one time, it was a very weak selling cigarette that was primarily designed for uh, what we would think of as. A upper class or, or upper middle class women or upper middle class or uh, gentry wannabes. I'll use the word gentry, not upper class, because you didn't upper. Some people think upper class; they think Vanderbilts uh, and and people like that. But gentry, the 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 educated elite intelligentsia, that female that was part of that society, the women that that Bertie Wooster was always uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, marrying in uh, Jeeves and Wooster, the old uh, British television show, uh, the, the women that he was always trying to avoid, and women who wanted to be like that. And it was uh, the, the, the positioning concept was mild as may. So it was a women's cigarette, but then they were coming out, the, the, the government told the cigarette company six months before, before that we're going to tell people the cigarettes are bad for them. And they're going to give them a six-month head start to do something about it. And they wanted to – They so the, the thing was they wanted to have a male filter cigarette. They wanted it for, to be okay for a man to smoke a filter cigarette and not be looked at as effeminate or unmanly. And so they uh, – uh, came up with this, re and they didn't want to change the product. They literally did not change the product. Or they took this, the actual product is the same. That was, they couldn't, they didn't have time to retool, remanufacture, uh, even come up with a new brand name. They had to have something right away. And so what they did was they took a weak selling women's brand, sacrificed it, and created a male brand. And eventually, I don't want to think, but the Marlboro Man, uh, the cowboy became eventually became not at first, but eventually became the Marlboro Man. And then after the uh, the imagery was so powerful that after they were prohibited from television advertising, uh, the print ads, the the image of the Marlboro Man was so well known that they didn't really need television after that. And Marlboro became the the you know most successful cigarette brand name probably in the history of brand names, uh, maybe Coca Cola could make a claim to being better. But uh, one of the, I'll say one of the most successful, and it was a re, so that repositioning campaign, you'll have to read about that. Uh, I don't want to give you too much information in advance. I have also listed in the test study guide some of the other great campaigns of history, uh, Timex watches. I've even got head and shoulders dander shampoo right there in the PowerPoints for this. The Gatorade Be Like Mike, uh, Miller Lite, Tastes Great, Less Filling. Uh, going way back, uh, Wheaties, Breakfast of Champion, uh, Wendy's, Where's the Beef? Uh, all of those are eligible. If there's something else that you want to do, you want to do the Coca-Cola Peace and Harmony campaigns of the 60 and the which uh, if you it, they have the ads actually in the Library of Congress website, the, the one that was the, probably the most famous of all the Coca-Cola ads was called Hilltop. And if you just Google Coca-Cola ad Hilltop, you can see that. Uh, but uh, if you have trouble, and, and there's plenty of stuff that you can find to read about most of these, uh, you get to pick which one you want to do on the exam of these others, or which two, up to two, I think I said, that you get to do on the other exam. And I expect you to do some outside reading. When you come in to take the test, and I'll remind you of this, you need to have, if you because you're using other sources, you need to have a bibliography. So you should go ahead and print out the bibliography, uh, and you can either, uh, I'll, you know, be several methods, and I'll talk about this in class, but generally since you're taking the test on the computer and the testing center on the uh, computer lab, at least in, two th in 2014, uh, you should go in there prepared to give me a citation. And because the if you get some off the web, the web URL may have, you know, like go on and on and on and on for three pages. I'm pretty happy if you give me the, the website, uh, the title of the article that you read, and the author. And then I can find that on the web and read about it myself. 
Uh, if you have something that's unattributed, uh, I don't want you to use Wiki uh, because it's unattributed, and uh, you got to get me something better than what's in Wiki for these different, uh, with the great campaigns of history. You, so you want something better than what's in Wiki. And then also, if you say something that is different than what I've heard, or different than what I've read, or different than what somebody else said, in particular, I want to go read it, and I'd like to be able to see the source. So for the great campaigns of history, which are the other, some, the, several of the other questions that are on the exam from Module 5, uh, you should go in, read about it, prepare an answer. Remember, you're, it's an open book or an open note test, so you're allowed to uh, prepare answers in advance. Uh, you have the test study guide, so you have an idea what you know the questions are going to be. I'm expecting, because of that, I'm expecting thorough answers. This is a, a true graduate level exam. And I've had several students tell me that, you know, before this class, up until this class, they haven't really had any graduate level exams. I don't believe that's true. I think most of the other professors at ETSU are, are also given graduate level exams. But this is a graduate level exams. I don't want any one or two sentence answers for, you know, these detailed questions. I'm, I'm looking for a thorough answer on each of these questions. Now, you have a limited amount of time. You'll have like two hours and 20 minutes. So you won't have forever to take the test. Uh, and I'll try to, I, you know, I know that uh, in the past I've used a, a two hour and 55 minute test and I've got to cut it down to 220 so some of the questions that I intended to be on the exam I'm going to take off of the exam and to make it a little bit shorter but so you need to be efficient with your time and I'm not saying you have to write a whole book on each question but it, no matter what any professor tells you when you take an exam more is better than less and in particular, this is an open note exam. You can prepare, prepare advance, answers in advance. And, and I'll be honest with y'all, some of y'all that are kind of, you know, you're B students at the graduate level, and I, you don't necessarily get to see the other students' answers. Uh, we have some really outstanding students in our MBA program, and when they go in to take a test that they can prepare for in advance, they're ready to knock it dead. And I'm reading that those other students' answers, and then I get to a low motivation student's answer, and it's like you know three sentences for one of these readings, two sentences, three sentences trying to describe one of these great campaigns of history, and that's that's not going to cut it. I mean, I you know the the other people that you're competing against, and that's you know, and I, of course I'm not. It's not competition. I don't I don't use a. Uh, I'd like for everybody in the class to get an A. I'm not going to curve things and force you know, the, the bottom 10% to take a C and the middle 50% to, to get a B uh, in, a, in a graduate. I know that a C is a failing grade in a graduate program. I really hate, I don't want to give anybody a C. Now, if, if you don't do the work, I'm, you, I'll give you a C. You know, you don't deserve to get a B, I'll give you a C. But I, I'm happy to give everybody A's. Uh, I've had really good students the last few years. The last two or three years that I've taught this course, I've had really outstanding students. And so that's, you know, you have to think about that as you go in to take this test, that I've been used to reading really good answers to these questions. So good luck on, on exam one. Uh, I hope, you know, that this wasn't too tedious for you watching these uh, podcasts on the, on the Internet, but I, it's, it was better than coming to class uh, when it was 20 degrees and we had, you know, snow and ice and everything on the ground. So anyway, I'll see you in class this Tuesday, the, this Tuesday night, or I'll see you in, if you're watching this a little bit later. I'll see you the next time we're in class, and, and good luck with exam one.